Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. This is the entirety of the first chapter. And you can find that passage in your pew Bibles in the New Testament section. It's actually near the very end of the Bible on page 245. I'm going to incorporate today's scripture reading right into the sermon as we go. So as we prepare to hear God's word and God's message to us this morning, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers, the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A long time ago, back in the dark ages, a certain wise man prophesied that the king's favorite horse was going to die soon. Sure enough, the horse died, and the king was outraged. He was convinced that the prophet had somehow orchestrated the death of his horse in order to make his own prophecy come true. So he summoned the prophet to him and said, if you are so wise, prophet, then predict for me the day upon which you will die. Well, the prophet realized that this was a trap. No matter what date he would choose, the king would have him killed on a different day, probably sooner rather than later, in order to disprove or discredit his prophetic abilities. So the prophet gazed into the horizon for a little while, and then said, O king, I cannot see with certainty the day of my own death. But one thing I do see clearly. My death will occur exactly two days before the death of the king. And so his life was spared. The book of Revelation is the final book of the Bible, and it's often been viewed as a collection of prophecies regarding the end of the world. In almost every generation since Revelation was written, it's been the subject of great speculation, debate, interpretation, and artistic representations. More recently, in our own lifetimes, it has been the subject of fictional books and movies, graphically depicting all of the cataclysmic disasters that we find in Revelation with great certainty as to the times, the places, and the people who will surely be involved in these things. And of course, in a time of global pandemic, government lockdowns, civil unrest, rioting, warfare in the Middle East, it's only natural that people would begin to ask themselves, wait a minute, is this what the Bible was talking about? Are we living in the end times right now? Spoiler alert, people have been looking at their times and asking that exact same question for, oh, about 2,000 years now, ever since the book was written. So I thought it might be helpful for us to take yet another look at this mysterious and often misunderstood book of the Bible, not just through the troubling lens of our own times, but also through the eyes of the people who wrote and first read this book. What did it mean to them? And if it is not, in fact, a prediction of impending doom, then what message of hope does it offer to people in all times and all places? Let's dive in, beginning with chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So this book actually begins with the word revelation. And in the original Greek that in which it was written, that word is apokalypsis, 
which is actually where we get our modern word apocalypse from. And when we hear the word apocalypse, we immediately think of the end of the world. That's what the word apocalypse has evolved over time to mean, in part because of the book of Revelation. But I think that the translation in your Bibles of apocalypsis as revelation is a really good translation. Apocalypsis is made up of two Greek roots, kalupto, which means to cover or to conceal or to hide, and the preposition apo, meaning un. So literally, apocalypsis means to uncover or to reveal. And so this book of Revelation is not necessarily a revelation of the end of the world. It's a revelation of things that would have been hidden or mysterious to the people who first read it and perhaps those who continue to read it today. And in fact, there's an entire genre of literature in ancient times that the book of Revelation belongs to. It's called apocalyptic literature. And that style of writing was about as popular back then as suspense thrillers and horror movies are for us today. Actually, that's a great comparison because a lot of our modern day horror movies and suspense thrillers are speculative fiction. They show us in graphic detail what might happen or what could happen or what most certainly will happen if we aren't careful, if we mess around carelessly with science or nature or technology, or if we fail to heed the warnings of wise people in our midst. And so on one level, the book of Revelation fits squarely into that category. Its author, identified here as a man named John, is warning the communities within his sphere of influence of the consequences of their actions. And he's doing this with a little bit of help and insight from none other than Jesus Christ, who sends his angel as a messenger to John. And John faithfully takes pen to parchment and passes on the message that he's been given, beginning in verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's kind of like the envelope heading on our letters that we write, or that section of your email that has the to, the from, the subject line all in it. This is from John by way of Jesus, and it lists all of Jesus' titles, to the seven churches in Asia. Now, numbers, we'll come to learn in the next few weeks, are very, very important in the book of Revelation. And no number is more important than the number seven. John is writing to seven specific churches in his day, and he speaks of seven spirits standing before God's throne, representing those seven churches. Whether that's meant to be taken figuratively or literally, I don't know, but I do know that every church, even in today's world, has a certain spirit, a certain ethos, and every church, including this one, is ultimately held accountable for, to God for what it does and for what it fails to do. John continues in verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. Now that, of course, is a reference to Jesus, whose crucifixion at the hands of the Roman government would still be a fresh wound in the minds of the early church, even more so in John's time as he writes this book, because the Roman government by then had already begun to hunt down and kill people who publicly identified themselves as Christians. 
And so there was this very powerful sentiment in John's day, even a hope that Jesus would be coming back soon in order to settle the score with those Romans. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now that's actually the second time we've heard that exact phrase, this idea that God is Lord over the past, the present, and the future. And this is a critical key, a recurring theme throughout the book of Revelation. In fact, I'd go so far as to say you cannot understand the book of Revelation if all you see it as is a book about the future. It may have some of that in it, but it is also a book about the past and the present in the time in which it was written. For John, this vision that God has given him is wrapped up in the history of God's people in Israel and also the more recent history of Jesus and his life on this earth. Also, in John's present-day context as a persecuted minority in the Roman Empire. More on that in verse 9. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance. I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. We know from the Roman historian Tacitus that the island of Patmos, which is just off the coast of modern-day Turkey, was a penal colony a place where prisoners and political dissidents were sent in order to prevent them from influencing others, kind of like Australia or the American colonies in the 18th century. And so we know that John, who's writing from Patmos, would not even be there if he hadn't already proven himself to be a threat to Roman law and order. John continues his letter in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that is, Sunday, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Theatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now next week we are going to look in greater detail at what God, through John, has to say to those seven churches. For now, it's enough for us to know that these are real historical cities, not far from the island of Patmos, all of which are in present-day Turkey, and that is the main stage for the early Christian church in the New Testament. Verse 12. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined as in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining with full force. So this vision of a man who is like the Son of Man is a pretty clear reference to Jesus, that was Jesus' favorite title for himself, Son of Man. And yet in so many ways, this image that John describes is very unfamiliar. White hair, white face, eyes flaming, sword coming out of the mouth. But every one of those are symbols. Everything from the seven stars to the feet like burnished bronze. And those symbols show up later in the letters to the churches, each symbol attached to a specific church and bearing a specific meaning. What catches my attention here today and what I want to talk about is actually the very first symbol, though. It's the seven golden lampstands. There is a coded message here, and it's one that highlights the importance 
of understanding the past in order to understand the book of Revelation. You see, at the heart of the worship practices of the ancient Hebrew people, from the time of Moses right up through the time of Jesus, was something called a menorah. You've probably heard of that before from Jewish tradition. A menorah is a seven-branched candle, all one piece but with seven branches, and it would have been placed upon the altar in the center of the temple in ancient Jerusalem. In the year 70 AD, just a few years before this book, Revelation, was written, the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, leveling it to the ground. It was never, and to this day, has never been rebuilt. The menorah in the temple was destroyed along with it. And so John's vision of seven separate individual golden lampstands, one representing each of the seven churches that he writes to, is a symbolic message in itself to those churches. You are the new temple altogether. Even though you are dispersed, even though the menorah is broken, you are now the light of God shining in the darkness of a post-temple world. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And right there in those words, do you see past, present, and future? First is past. Last is future. Living one is present. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. There it is again. I was dead, past. I am alive, present, forever and forever, future. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is and what is to take place after this. That's there too. Write what you have seen, past, what is, present, and what is to take place after this, the future. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now chapter one ends here. And we'll continue next week with the seven messages to the seven churches. But right here, at the end of the first chapter of Revelation and at the very beginning of the book, here is where I think we find our message of hope, both in John's time and in our own time. It is a message that runs throughout the entire Bible, especially showing up in difficult and challenging times. This is the message. Do not be afraid. You see, the world around us tells us frequently that the fear of death and the fear of disease and the fear of poverty and the fear of warfare should be the basis of our every action, our every decision, and our every waking thought. And that's not just true in 2021. It's been true for thousands of years. And that's because fear is a very efficient means of control for governments, for mass media outlets, for commercial enterprises, and yes, for churches too. But God tells us over and over again in Revelation and throughout the scriptures, do not be afraid. In particular, do not be afraid of things that threaten your body, your reputation, your livelihood, your property. Don't be afraid because none of those things was meant to last in any case. And you will lose all of those things someday. Everyone does. If you are to fear losing something, Fear those things which threaten eternal things like your soul, your humanity, your relationship with a God who holds the keys to life and death in his competent and compassionate hands. You see, the truth is none of us knows the number of days that has been allotted to us. 
None of us knows or has that much control over the future, the rise and fall of nations and empires, or the crises and cataclysms that unfold before our eyes. But God has given you control over this one small thing. Where you put your faith, your hope, your trust, and your confidence. Don't put it in people or things or human institutions which change and change again and change again with every passing day. Put your hope in the God who was, who is, and is to come. And do not be afraid. Let us pray. Lord, you created us to enjoy and for us to enjoy the world that you made around us. And yet so often we let things of our own making come into that enjoyment and ruin it. Things like fear. Fear that we may lose something that we think is precious to us and in that fear and clinging to it, we fail to ever gain the hope and the promise and the beauty that you have in store for us. Help us not to be fearful. Help us to look around and see what you have given to us. Help us to live the lives you have called us to live. And help us to be that kind of light, that kind of joy, and that kind of hope to other people in our midst. Lord, we pray all of these things just as you taught your children to pray when we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.